I am Corey Kerr. And I'm Joshua Kemble. And this is the Indie Review Show. This is the series where we review the best indie comics and other media like movies, TV, cartoons, books, and did we mention comics? The idea is that we're pulling back the curtains on our inspirations. Josh and I have been professional illustrators, cartoonists, animators, graphic designers, and we've both taught creative arts courses at the college level. And we're getting into the things that we will pull and use in the next art that we create. And today we are talking about Lady Killer by Joelle Jones. But before we get into that, uh, let's do some plugs. Hello, Josh, what are you going to plug today? All right. So um, I need to switch to full screen for this business because I'm switching my cam. Boom. All right. So um, uh, this is uh, my graphic novel, which is um, two stories. It's a graphic novel that's hand lettered, hand inked, and hand illustrated. Um, a lot of hands in there, which is appropriate because this is a shot of my hands. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's 122 uh, pages, an autobiographical indie graphic novel about faith and mental illness. Um, and it's a very personal story to me. But uh, indie comics, as you'll see when we're reviewing these things, uh, tend to need support. So if you want to pick this up, ask your local comic shop. Um, and if not, uh, you can check out more information on joshuakimble.com. And you can also, uh, the preferred place to get this would be Amazon.com. I'm not like the hugest fan of Amazon for book buying, but the rankings uh, for indie books sort of dictate the rest of the market. So if you want to help me out and you like the content that we're reviewing, this should fit right along in that family on your shelf. So go buy that. Corey, uh, where can everybody find your work and what do you want to promote? Uh, you can find me at CoreyKerr.com. And uh, I just recently did a video where I did my first screen print. And so go go check that out. Um, it's, a, it's a sponsored video. So the better that that does, the more possibility I get for sponsors. But um, I'll be doing this patch for sale a little bit later. Um, you can just find that on my YouTube channel or on Instagram. I've got it listed on IGTV as well. I'll be doing this patch for sale a little bit later. Um, you can just find We've got some All right. Um, yeah. So. Uh, awesome. Yeah. So let's jump over. I want to jump over here. Let me turn the color back on. And uh, we'll talk about. I think we did that out of order. Now I'm realizing why we did that the way we did before. <laughs> I should have gone first. I will say uh, the patch looks really cool, and uh, and you guys should go to Corey's uh, YouTube at some point and like check out the process video of him screen printing it. It's really cool. Um, so anyhow, just saying. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, Joel Jones is one of my one of my favorite illustrators. She is just phenomenal. She's worked on um, she's worked on Batman titles, and uh, she came from indie. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully she goes back and finishes this because there's a little bit of a cliffhanger at the end of these two books. Um, but I am going to spend most of my time talking about, um, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about number two here, um, but I'm going to use number one to kind of introduce kind of what's going on. And so um, as far as, as far as this goes, we basically are looking at, um, this is our main character. This is Josie Schuler. And uh, she is a 1950s housewife, um, as well as being um, a hired assassin, so a mercenary. Mm. Um, and it's a pretty interesting, it's a pretty interesting book. We'll kind of get into uh, some other stuff. But as far as who did who did volume one here, um, Joelle Jones and Jamie Rich um, they co-wrote this, and then uh, Jones did the art. Colors are by Laura Allred. And uh, letters by Crank. Mm. There's a there's an intro by um, there's an intro by Chelsea Kane, um, and uh, and we'll just kind of we'll just kind of jump in. So the whole world takes place kind of in the 1950s. I can't remember exactly what year. Um, oh, sorry. Should we preface this before we start flipping through pages? This is 
definitely not an all ages book. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Let me, let me talk if, if, uh, so yeah, not an all ages book. Um, there are some pretty brutal murders, um, that happen in this book fairly frequently because of the nature of the book. And there is one, um, there's one scene that has some partial nudity. Um, I won't be showing the partial nudity on the, on the show, but, uh, if you're not comfortable with some fairly gruesome, uh, detailed illustrations of violence, uh, you should probably bow out now. Um, but, uh, but if you're into that, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a campy pulp fun way of doing that, even though some of it is fairly, fairly visceral. So yeah, good, good reminder. Thanks. Um, so anyway, so they started, uh, we start with, we start with, uh, Josie Schuler, uh, kind of dressed as an Avon lady. She knocks on this lady's door. Um, and one thing that you'll see, we'll kind of get more to this when we start talking about style. You'll see that Jones goes in for like backgrounds. Um, yeah. and she fully owns two things. I think she is incredibly good at. Um, one is just placing characters in the space really well. It, it almost looks like this is being shot. Uh, you, you can see Wes Anderson kind of shooting these types of movies. Um, you'll see a lot of patterns and you'll see a lot of intricate architecture. Mm. Um, and then the other thing that I really love about what she does is the acting of the characters. Um, and, and I'll kind of point out a, a couple of these as we go through, but, uh, as she's drawing, uh, Josie in these different scenes, you can see her begin to act and you can see her when she's kind of being real. Um, and it's, it's a fascinating juxtaposition between panel to panel. The, the duplicity of this character is at the core of, of this story. I love it. I, I also just want to say, like, just from the get-go, like, that mid-century modern, like, intro type, and it definitely looks like the costuming is is just striking from the get-go, you know? Like, that the first page you opened to, I was like, that looks like a house industries font. Like, it's beautiful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I think Jones is a real a real nerd for uh, kind of this time period, the, the mid-century uh, 1950s madman style because it's not it's not surface level it's not like uh it's not like somebody who's who's read a wikipedia page or looked looked at a couple images on pinterest it is it is period appropriate both both in its historicity and the time period in the architecture and there's one point in time where she jumps back into the 30s and you can feel both in the colors and in the and in the design and illustration you can feel the time shift wow and, it, and it, so she's really good at it. So anyway, so she uh, she tries to she tries to poison this lady's tea while she's not looking. So she hits her hits her in the face with this spray so that she coughs. While she's coughing, she drops this in. And this is something that we'll see several times where um, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of a uh, cartooning that's happening, even though there's a fairly realistic looking setting the characters and the characters in interaction with the environment tends to do like these little things where like only really comics does this really well. So yeah. this little skull kind of plume that's going on. And then the dogs spoil that. <clears throat> and so then uh, we see what, uh, what turns out to be a theme is that uh, Josie really doesn't kill cleanly. Uh, she gets messy. It's a fairly violent thing. And it's been pointed out by people that uh, that she kills like a man, right? And so there, that's this whole the whole kind of theme of this book is kind of this idea of subverting expectations and overcoming uh, gender stereotypes. Um, yeah. Ironically, it's, it's doing it through you know some fairly aggressive kind of murders. But uh, notice the acting that's going on in, in the action here and the framing of these shots. And so if this, if this were a movie, you've got shot reverse shot here where we go, you know, on, on Josie, we pull back into a silhouette so we can really see the kitchen and get a feel for the position of what's going on with the silhouette of the hammer. And then we see her look at the knife block. So the, the fight scenes, um, there's a couple of them that are, that are kind of awkward and hard to follow, mm -hmm. but for the most part, um, you're able to feel the space and feel the characters of where they are in the space. So she goes for this knife. They fight for a bit. 
And then the, the juxtaposition that I really love that's, that's happening here is that she gets a little bit of blood on her dress after a fairly gruesome, you know, stabs this woman in the chest. She dies, you know, it's, it's, it's gory. Right. And then she has this surprised look and just says, darn it. Because she got a little stain on her dress. And so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of her, this opening scene sets the scene for this character. She is, she is hyper vigilant about not letting her day job bleed into literally uh, her home life. And so she does everything she possibly can to keep those two worlds completely separate. Um, and so even when she's, you know, has just been in this violent altercation, um, she still is looking at her dress with the blood stain and doesn't swear, doesn't curse. She just says, darn it. Wow. Um, so Gary has joined us in the chats. Um, hey, Gary. And he he mentioned the bloody dog uh, footprints is such a dark touch. <laughs> and that's totally true. Like, it seems like it almost is a... Uh, taking joy in the violence like on a on an almost like um pulp fiction-esque level um which is really pretty cool and striking so far yeah and if you look um if you look there's even like streaks where you know arms and, and limbs have kind of like spread and you can start you can see that the position of the dogs and the position of the woman uh, yeah. is consistent even though the camera angles change um but you'll you'll see this like kind of dog uh, stain, lack of swearing, um, gore, kind of juxtaposition throughout the entire entire story. There's there's always this. So so pay attention to how this feels, how it's being colored, how it's illustrated, and then on the page flip, after we see you know one of the more violent things that you that you can see, um, this is this is her home life. And oh, I mean wow. this, this looks like. You know a, a valentine's card i mean this looks like an advertisement that you would see you know in the 50s for you know some sort of something that's selling something to, to housewives i mean they're just happily married they've got you know the twins are kind of all over the place and i mean these guys they look like they look like they're selling cereal you know i mean it's uh I'll, i'm just going to get a close-up on on the faces that she's drawing for these girls yeah that's unbelievable it's funny too can i can can I get a shot of that um, character too, like her husband or the guy? Because he looks quite a bit like um, like the way that she's designing his posture and face. It's like the 101 Dalmatians. Uh, right. Character. Um, that's just really amazing. And there is really like a beautiful line quality to her character art. That's really yeah. cool. Um, and then this is the first time that we get introduced to her family. And so she has, she has her husband and her two uh, little girls, uh, blonde girls and braided pigtails. And then in the, in the background of each of these scenes, we see the very angry mother-in-law mm. um, <clears throat> who is, uh, who is German and half the time speaks in a German accent uh, and really hates Josie. Hmm. Um, and here's kind of here's kind of some of the some of the acting that I like going on. So you see that you see up here she's she's very angry. Um, Josie uh, or, or Joelle Jones is really good at at uh, aging and de aging people. Okay. So we'll, we'll catch her later when she's Josie's age, and it still looks like her. And so it's it's really quite good. But you see, just uh, you know the the contrast between. The poses we've got kind of the swooping dress yeah she answers the phone and we've got the kind of the folded arms you know beautiful shot here i just love the way that she draws faces and and everything um now what's happening here is peck is the other character that we need to be introduced to peck is josie's handler um for her uh assassination business and so he's he's her direct report he's calling her with a job and um, so this page is one of those pages that I think really sells this idea where you can see um, the thought process of this character. And so there is a distinct shift where she is telling him, like, this is inappropriate. Do not call me in my home. This is not OK. Um, she hangs up the phone. 
she has this moment of contemplation and then really oversells you know when when she goes back into wife mode and says dinner's ready huh. and so just that i mean the expressions that the characters carry is just incredible okay so then uh we'll skip ahead here basically he's kind of a flirt uh you know mother-in-law sees them and assumes that she's cheating on her uh on her husband uh he gets a job gives her a job um, that job, of course, is at a, a very thinly veiled uh, Playboy um, kind of bunny place. Um, <clears throat> and so then she does she does a hit, and there's all kind of the the Mad Men, you know, 1950s. We see all the execs kind of in this in this environment. Um, she lures one of them back, and then we go back into and you notice that things get get duller and and warmer colors as we kind of jump in. And I love I love panels like this. Yeah. Where we can see that she is just hiding, ready to pounce. And then the way when and where she uses silhouettes is just is just great. So like I said, I'm gonna speed through the I'm gonna speed through the first uh, the first uh, chapter here because it's not as dynamic as the rest. And so we see, you know, they're disposing of the body. Again, like, I don't know what it is about metal and glass and, and being able to tell just in ink, like, what different materials are. I'm, I'm always yeah. for that. Does she ink her own work? I'm sorry, I might have missed that. Yeah, so uh, I saw in an interview that she did at one point in time that she pencils and inks two pages a day by herself. Dude, she's a monster. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> she is incredible. That's amazing. Um, so this is this is the other character that we need to be introduced to in the in the first book, and he is the the boss. He's the one that runs uh, this company. But we can see, uh, you know, kind of that nineteen fifties aesthetic of the office environment. Wow, she just really—it's it, like, yeah, the research involved in this is insane. Like down to his glasses that are on his desk. That's yeah, and so. And we get it. We get a better shot of his desk, and he's got the like executive pen holder thing. Yeah, you know, he's got this this kind of lamp over here. That's amazing. You know, the telephone. Anyway, it's all it's all extremely period appropriate. He's no. He even has like a tie bar. Wow. So anyway, so he is. He's kind of questioning her. And then notice notice the shift in tone uh, as we go from the kind of muted, desaturated color palette, um, a lot of a lot of grays and tans, um, yeah. and then we burst back into her home life where we have a lot of blonde people, teals, and and things like that that we kind of move into. Yeah. And so, and every some of the writing of this is is really quite clever in the way that they, you know that she's saying, you know, busy day. And she says, yeah, you could say that, you know, like she's, she's murdered two people today. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I just, I, I love the kind of posed, you know, almost, this could almost be an advertisement. But you look at their home and, uh, and it's kind of a rancher style, you know, yeah. with the, the cantilevered over, overhangs, but there's just an incredible amount of detail. And actually Jones gets significantly better at this um, through these pages and through the books. And so pages like this start to become significantly more frequent um, as, as we kind of move on. Wow. Uh, that's that's great. Career. That's great. Like as she gets further in the book, she doesn't drop off the quality. It, it picks up. That's impressive. Yeah. Wow. That house, that car. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then I love that there's just these advertisements. Um, I, I'm assuming that these are the, the covers for the floppies. Um, but she's about to throw a tiki party. And so you can see as you're going through here, I mean, I'm just going to, I'm going to zoom in on this. So we have this establishing shot panel um, of all of these different drinks and cigarette smoke. And we've got music kind of floating through the air. And then just check out this crowd scene. 
And it's actually interesting that as we go through this, um, this scene that you'll see these different characters, like this, this woman in yellow and this woman in pink, um, you can tell that you can tell that she's pissed and that she's saying something stupid um, while all these <laughs> other people are saying, and we have these speech bubbles that are floating through the air um, that aren't connected to anyone. So it's almost like these disembodied, it's like party noise. Uh, it's a really interesting lettering technique that they've done. Wow. But then as, but then as we go, we see um, these two are still in that, in that same fight before. Um, and the crowd, the crowd scene just continues in this big giant double page spread on this panel. Wow. And it's framed, it's framed by these two characters kind of shaking hands. That's right. And then we always cut back to the fifties. So we're cutting two cigarettes, right? Um, notice that the kids are kind of hanging out. Okay. And then again, we have. She ends a lot of pages like this, where it's just a character in a total shock look so that we want to turn the page. Nice, like a, a nice suspenseful page turn. Okay, and then we land with, uh, we land with, you know, her mother sitting alone at the table, or her mother-in-law sitting alone at the table, you know, saying, hey, I saw you with that, you know, with that man, you lied about him. I know what's really going on. Okay, so anyway, long story short, her handler and her boss, her boss basically says, um, you know, I've reviewed, I've reviewed the file, I've looked at what's going on, um, and you can see like in the, in the file, you've got all these gruesome murders. Well, he's, he's a full on, full on misogynist, and just feels like women who do this type of line of work, um, you know, there's something wrong with them or whatever. Totally ironic because he is also somebody who, who kills people for a living, huh. um, and uh, you know, is blind to his own hypocrisy. But basically, he says, um, "I've sent her to go kill a child, and uh, after this job, I want you know, you've got to offer. She's she's done here. I don't trust her. I can't trust women. That's kind of that, that's kind of that type of thing." So then she goes to she goes to murder this kid, and uh, this is where. Um, we'll, we'll play this in a minute. Uh, one of our viewer, viewers, Gary, has has some stuff. There's some kind of on the nose stuff. I actually really like it, but you see kind of the anger in this kid's face, but then you see the sad puppy in the background, um, and you, they're kind of posed the same, looking the same way. Yeah. And the basic the basic idea is that that Josie has been sent to to murder this kid because he saw his parents murdered. And so he's an he's an accessory and a witness uh, to kind of that situation. Um, so then she chases him up the stairs. Some nice forced perspective. Something I haven't pointed out yet, but probably everybody has seen is the the really awesome just ink splatter that is throughout the negative space yeah. of panels. Yeah, it also feels like, especially in the sequences where she's sort of on a job, like she uses a lot more ink spatter. <laughs> right. So anyway, so she, uh, you know, she knows where he is. She sees all his toys, um, takes a look at his family, and then she kind of just speaks into the air and just kind of tells him, well, boy, I hope he doesn't, you know, do X, Y, and Z because then I'd never be able to catch him. And she, so she kind of explains to him how to get away. And then she gets mad at herself for, you know, being emotional and not, and not finishing the job. And she sees Peck in the rearview mirror. I love this sequence. Um, where where we start here, we go down the stairs, we get an establishing shot of her getting in the car. Yeah. Um, and then we see her break down, close up on her eyes, pull back. You can almost feel the camera pull back from that rearview mirror shot where we still see her eyes. And then as she adjusts the mirror, because her hand is on the rear, we see the we see the car, then we see her eyes in the car and then we see her take off That's in really this well. giant bench seat <laughs> then there's a car chase okay so you know there's kind of a basic exchange here 
you know, this guy kind of intervenes. He gets killed. Josie's Josie's gone. And uh, more car chase. And then stuff like this is just, I mean, that woman is just phenomenal. Yeah, I'm like, the even the car choices are great, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not, not all of them necessarily in the 50s, but, um, like, some of these would be much earlier cars, um, you know, kind of the, with the wood paneling and everything. But, you know, the guy who's all flash and fancy, you know, he's, he's, he's driving a more current vehicle. That's so awesome. So she is currently... She is currently being chased and running for her life. And yet she takes the time to, to make some phone calls and set up some kind of stuff going back and forth. This lady's obviously very upset with what's going on. Um, I mean, this is like Disney character acting. Yeah. Um, and then I love that she's like, you know, she comes home. They have this like this moment. Um, you see the twins in tutus and matching tutus and she takes them um she takes them to take them to dance lessons. They take off, you know, there's more chasing. Uh, she meets this, she meets this woman. She's actually, she's following him. So he's going to, this is another operative. She's trying to get out. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's the basic story for the first book <clears throat> at the end of this. I love uh, the play. Sorry, in these those panels you just flip past. I love the play of the two. She just uses like flat black for the hair. Yeah. And then it's kind of having fun with like those two flat black shapes and the inks. It's really cool. It's just like there's a lot of like really sophisticated like 2D design going on. Yeah, and you can see that as they are uh as they're at odds with each other, yeah, they, they have distinct silhouettes. But as they start to come together uh, and 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 come to an agreement, uh, their hair actually connects in a way that gives them kind of a shared silhouette. So you can kind of see the relationship. So literally uh, get closer. Um, they fight. She talks her into helping her out so that she can help her get out. Uh, and then this guy is going to be really important in book two. This is Irving, and so we'll see here that he is also um, he's also an assassin. Nice. Nice big cutaway of uh, of this apartment complex. So he murders that guy. And then it all happens at the World Fair. And I'm actually really excited for Josh to see this next page just because of, I know, Josh. Oh, I love it. So we have uh, we have somewhat of a TV commercial um, that's that turns out to be like this slideshow, slideshow presentation, um, you know, of what's going to happen at the World's Fair. Huh. And so she dresses up as a Pan Am stewardess um, with her with her new recruit there. These are the two guys that are going after him. This is Irving, who they recruited to help them out. Yeah, that uh, whole section on the Space Needle was totally UPA-ish. Good, good call, uh, Gary. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that fits the whole aesthetic of the of the Space Needle too. That's so cool. I, yeah. I also have to say, like, it seems like a lot of the plot is almost like this beautiful excuse. Like, it, it's really cool, but it's like a beautiful excuse to have all this wonderful costume work. Like, down right. to, like, hems. Like, look at the hem on that skirt. Like, it's, like, literally, I mean, it's just so well-researched. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really impressed. Like the way the ties are on the men, it's like accurate, period accurate. It's very interesting. Yeah. Like research went into this. Yeah. Yeah. It's it really is like watching a well researched TV show. I mean, it, it's it the, the parallels to Mad Men keep coming back. Uh fight scene, um, a little bit more clunky. Uh it it, it, it takes a little bit to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, I feel like in some of these shots. Um, and then just, you know, for no particular reason, we need to have a room that is just full of uh, two-point vanishing perspective cubes. <laughs> because at this point in time, I think we're just kind of showing off. But uh, but it fills the space really well. And notice, like, a very Magnolia thing to do where we have, you know, light on dark, dark on light to kind of help, uh, you know, help the figure ground situation there. Low camera angles. Uh, to give her kind of more power. 
And then yeah. the camera lifts up to kind of give her an even look. So anyway, she they fight. I'm going to skip past this because I want to make sure I get to the end here. But uh, there's lots of action. They fight. She ends up, uh, he kills her partner. Um, you know, distorted an anatomy to really show what's going on, followed by almost a background of like sound waves uh, on some kind of poster. And then we see that uh, those sound waves continue to come through. Um, and we see that her mother-in-law was watching this entire thing, thinking that she was having an affair with this guy when in fact, uh, you know, she's she just murdered him. And then uh, it closes like it opened. Uh, somebody knocks on her door uh, and says, Avon calling, you know, Mrs. Schuler. when was the last time you took time out for your beauty? Uh, which is just a beautiful juxtaposition to, or juxtaposition to uh, this string of, this trail of dead bodies that she left in her wake. Wow. Uh, and then she comes home and just feels like this is an invasion and, uh, and slams the door. And her, and her husband says, hey, maybe you should think of uh, going into business for yourself like that Avon woman. You know, maybe you could learn something about that and feel a sense <laughs> of accomplishment. So that's, so that's book one, which I feel like is the weaker of the two books and still really incredible. That's very incredible. Um, yeah, my impressions are just like on the art alone, just for the period research and the locations and then the costuming. Um, and, and also I do like that there's a lot of very low angle shots, like even that sequence that was in the off office, um, where it was like a low angle shot that was really fascinating and cool. I also yeah. really like, uh, whoever this crank is, who's doing the lettering. Yeah. It, it, it's really nice lettering. Um, the headers are great. They feel very like house industries. And I mean that in the best of, um, as in the best of compliments because yeah anyone who would think house industries is an insult just doesn't know type <laughs> <laughs> so we see these these kind of style of advertisements where you know she's in kind of like a pinup pose um but covered in blood holding a hammer with a bunch of corpses in the background and then we cut to uh she is um selling a group of women Tupperware who don't care about what's going on. There's some conversation in the background about how, uh, you know, their nephew isn't going to inherit anything because he's kind of a schlub and uh, everybody's kind of ignoring them and they kind of leave with, but look at this. Not only is it period appropriate, but we actually see that, you know, this is a fairly wealthy individual um, just in the, in the open space, uh, in this era that this type of open open environment would have been really expensive most most homes have a much much more walled off situation so you can kind of see you know these are yeah. very people and then she gets killed on the toilet almost comically it's rather noisy she comes out and uh you know and somebody says oh it's fine she just has a bloody nose and she looks at like this giant splatter and she's like man that is just don't get anything on my carpet <laughs> and uh, so then she dies as well and then the interesting thing is in in the second volume um uh joelle jones is writing this herself so so um uh jamie jamie rich is no longer involved in the writing of volume two um and uh, and there's a, there's a shift in the writing in that there's a lot there's a lot more boxes and these thought boxes are actually uh, like I think seven um, seven pieces of business advice oh. that she's giving herself and she, you can see how she's like incorporating that into it it gets rather gruesome here as she kind of decides that her hacksaw isn't gonna hack it and so she gets the uh, the electric turkey carver to carve everybody up and then carries everybody out in their own uh, Tupperware that they didn't purchase. Huh. Um, the family has now moved They're, They live in Florida to kind of escape what went down in the world fair. Um, you know, some not so subtle symbolism of mother-in-law 
um, just demolishing this this uh, piece of meat with a meat tenderizer. But I mean, I almost bought this page. Um, I have I actually have two pages of hers. One one is I'll show you in a minute, but um, I almost purchased this page hmm. just because I loved. I mean, how complicated this this kind of awning, yeah, uh, house is. And I That's love the fact that there's a story excuse for them to live in a different home just so we can, you know, draw a more complicated home. Even the other one was fairly complex as well, but just something different. Yeah. And the mid century modern houses are just, it's so cool. It's, um, and even that umbrella, man, like just the yeah. underside of that umbrella, having that pattern is brilliant. Like it's just, wow. Huh. So we meet his new boss, um, who's kind of a slime ball and, you know, has a trophy wife and is hitting, hitting on her. Um, and you can see, uh, he tells, he tells a joke here that isn't funny and is kind of off color. And, uh, I just love their reaction and his reaction <laughs> and her reaction. Um, and then, you know, just kind of the, the like, Oh yeah, it's hilarious. You know? And then the pinching of the cheeks. I mean, like just a lot of the a lot of the moments are really um, interesting choices for like the condescending nature of kind of this uh, this era. So then she goes to uh, then she goes to a car lot. Um, we've got balloons and streamers. Uh, you know, this guy tries to hit on her. Um, he turns out to be her mark. She kills him. Uh, but now she's on her own. So now she has to do her own cleanup. She has to do her own kind of prep work. Um, she's not part of an agency anymore. <laughs> and she's kind of struggling with it. He falls out of the car uh, on top of her. He's a bigger guy than she is. You know, she still has the, the physical limitations of being kind of petite. And, uh, and then this guy shows up. And we find out who that is in the next issue. It's Irving, who helped her at the World Fair. And huh. so he comes and gives her a business proposition of saying, hey, I'm really old, but I still love this, love doing this type of stuff. Let me be your cleanup crew. I'll take care of everything. You can do all the killing, and we'll kind of have a partnership. They agree to kind of like a split on the proceeds there. Um, but, I mean, I think this whole swamp scene is really just to prove that, uh, that Jones can nail kind of environmental uh, stuff as well as architecture because, I mean, the trees and, yeah. and the water and everything are just incredible. And we cut to the beach and there's a whole discussion that's period appropriate from uh, bikinis coming into style. And everybody's talking about Josie's older style of, of thing. Irving kind of comes and. Can you go back to that page? I just want to point out like the color palette choice. Actually it's on that page too, but I think it's really a cool choice to actually have these really muted and desaturated like shadow tones not that page but the next yeah on each like that's such an unusual way to do well, it we're having foreground figures being yeah being having the shadow. foreground like treated under shadow is actually pretty rare and that's that's kind of interesting to see i like that um that's just an interesting color choice you know yeah and and interesting you know being flanked by bikinis while he's commenting on her older style of thing and they're in shadow and then when they're under the umbrella yeah and being lit from behind and having the colorist catch that you know he would be more silhouetted yeah it's great and then i just love the garish nature of like this beach party in florida that they're having during christmas <laughs> the sand uh a sand snowman and this this horrible looking pink tree <laughs> So the girls go and play. Uh, Irving kind of shows up, and Josie is not happy with that situation because, again, this is kind of mixing her her work life with her home life. He introduces himself as Uncle Irving, Irving on her mother's side. So now she has to play along, and her husband is kind of like, "I didn't, I didn't know that you had this." She gets this this kind of weird invitation from uh, uh, from somebody she doesn't know what's going on, and she goes into. Uh, a church that is that has been converted into a bingo hall, and uh, during this whole situation, we see um, Satan tempting Jesus in the stained glass in the background. So 
So this is this is another guy. Uh, he's offering kind of an agency situation. Um, at this point, I don't know that I really want to go like um, story points. So if you want to read this, go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of jump through uh, just some other things that I find um, really interesting. So yeah, I mean that the change in environment that just keeps happening. Like she just seems like fearless in the sense of just being like, I'm going to have a bingo hall in an old church. Like, you know, like um, just like, it's almost like she constantly is keeping it really fascinating. Like the differences and that that's really striking to me. So I, 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 feel, I, feel, I feel somewhat of a kinship to, to Joelle Jones because I feel like she is writing this story to give herself the excuses to do the things that she wants to do. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I do in, in my cartooning and my animation is like, you know, what story excuse can I have to do this thing? You know, and, yeah. and it's yeah. So I, I totally agree. You can you can tell what's going on. Um, but notice the confidence in her in her uh in her figure drawing and facial expressions, I feel like is really from the first issue of this to now. Um, she's got heavier line work uh that's yeah. more nuanced, uh taper, tapering. Um, there's a little bit more fluidity to the lines mm -hmm. uh, and the structure kind of the anatomy starts to bend somewhat. Then we get yeah, this sorry. incredible montage of horribleness. What were you going to say? Oh, sorry. Uh, Gary was saying in the chats, uh, you can see Jones got more confident and ambitious in volume two. And that's totally true. It's like, you can just see like a fluidity and confidence in her, in the characters and the style. Um, and yeah, holy moly, that's a great, that's great. <laughs> so you see, you see all of this. Uh, yeah. And I totally agree with that. She gets much more confident. Um, I love the way that she draws old people because um, they don't feel like the crypt keeper, but they feel very old. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a very subtle uh, wrinkles and things like this. And then just the character choices that she makes, you know, um, looking at herself in a compact uh, with pearl necklaces um, and those pearl necklaces you see actually being used to kill someone in one of these panels. And then she took them from the body and, uh, and decided to use them herself. Um, you see cleaning solution, kind of bleach. And then on this side, he's just straight business. He has no, and this is in, in volume two, what you'll see is that Irving is trying to get her to realize that she's living this dual life and she should just give into who she is. And he fully commits to who he is. I mean, he's not pretending to be anything that he's not. Uh, he's got kind of the butcher, the butcher knife that he's sharpening. Um, you know. Any, anyway, it's it. it's interesting to kind of see that them getting paid. Uh, we see here that uh, the mother-in-law recognizes Irving, um, and that becomes really important here in a minute. But just just take a moment to take in like Christmas in Florida in the fifties. Yeah, and that background on the left, too, is just, in, I mean, the compositions of these pages, oh, man. Yeah, and the colorist kind of uh, does an excellent job here. You almost don't notice, because of what's going on here, that there are just a pile of bodies Yeah, in the, in the background there that just kind of fade in because there's so much other interesting things to look at. Um, very intentionally, you know, we're, we're, we're focusing on that relationship. And then, uh, and then we cut into anime speed lines. So we kind of see uh, we're cutting away from intricate backgrounds, and we see um, distorted perspective of, of this uh, ornament being thrown. And this is where um, Mother Schuler realizes that uh, she knows this guy. Mm. Um, she tries to she tries to kill him with a potato masher. Right there. So anyway, and I love that they're having a conversation while facing away from each other and that they're yeah. separated uh, in this argument that they're having. They're never facing towards each other. Uh, just the blocking of this scene is is incredible. Um, <laughs> Frank Salazar was asking, is this Dexter in comic form? I, I think the only difference between this is like Dexter is kind of doing it as a, as a hobby. And uh, in this case, it's like she's a professional killer. Um, 
Yeah, and Dexter timing is obviously very different too. And yeah, Dexter tends I've never seen the show, but Dexter tends to be a little bit of an anti-hero because he's he's trying to do things for good and she's mm -hmm. just a straight up assassin for hire. Um so anyway, this is this is one of the two things that I want to point out before I run out of time here. Um we are about to we are about to shift in time back to World War II, mm -hmm. and we find out that uh Mother Schuler, her her was was a Nazi, and so here's a picture of her, and then we shift into some of the most beautiful abstract pages I've seen. Um, I mean, just the overlap and the continuation of things into other things to draw us into the panels, being framed almost in an Art Nouveau situation. What we see is that Mother Schuler, as a as a young girl. Um, was a was a Nazi officer, intelligence officer, and went after this guy, um, who is a doctor. Uh, she seduced him, and we notice that in this shot, her hair starts to encompass the shadows um, of his home, mm -hmm. and scenes of them together, and and what he's doing and what she's doing start to bleed into each other. Um, we, we just get into an extremely abstract mm -hmm. situation that's just incredible. Um, and I mean, the light and shadow here is, it just, it just blows me away. Um, yeah. I almost bought the next page, but it was, it was out of my, out of my budget at the time. And now I don't know who owns it because now I want it. But this page I think is one of my favorite spreads that I've ever seen in any comic book uh, where we see, this character injecting cyanide into people. So what's happening is he would he was being investigated by the Nazis because they thought he was running a smuggling ring where people would pay him money and he would smuggle them out of the country. When in fact, what he was doing is people would pay him money and, he, and then he would kill them and take all of their possessions. Wow. And you can see him uh, bleeding into like this ethereal kind of smoke uh, that kind of frames this page as we see this circle, this very circular flow of this. You see the staircase, the cyanide leads up into him, the lettering leads over into these skulls, and we just come full circle. So you see that he's killing these people. As they are coming down the stairs to be saved, he kills them, they turn in, you know, and it's kind of this continual loop. Yeah. I also, so, on the left, I just love the fact that she left that entire dress as just... Uh, like negative shape yeah so sophisticated this whole spread but that's just yeah it's it's really impressive yeah this this negative shape and the skulls and then there's no delineation between that and the sky of yeah this other shot. incredible gothic home here so you can really feel the jump in time period cool and then we're back um and uh so you know, we come back into the into the modern time. I, I won't go, like I said, I won't go um, over story beats again, but Irving does her a favor and kills her husband's boss for him. Uh, and she's, you know, Irving has misinterpreted that situation and is overstepping. She gets kind of pissed about it. I'm going to go kind of fast here for a minute. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is another office environment um, in aviation, but you can kind of see we get very mechanical industrial situation here. We see uh, her husband trying to fit in. He doesn't fit in in a number of ways. He's wearing yellows while everybody else is wearing blues. He's blonde. They're all dark or redhead. Um, is that the space shuttle? Yes. Hmm. I think. Wow. It's so that or a plane. I'm not sure. I don't know if we have any. Yeah, it looks like the it looks like the space shuttle, but but keep going. <laughs> yeah, could be. I'm not sure. But I love these little gossipy scenes that you kind of see in the background. I mean, there's just yeah, this is a very small uh, panel, but packed with um, you know just office gossip that he's not a part of. That's so great. And then I, I feel like I know a guy like this. Huh. So again, um, you know, we see this kind of thing and we keep going. There's been an, 
this is where he, the cops are investigating him for, for doing whatever. Um, she is sent to a, um, a strip club. Uh, I'll skip these pages here. Um, but I mean, just this, this, this kind of like from him into the seedy street environment, into that being mopped up and, uh, We'll skip these pages. She kills that lady. Uh, this is the this is the page that I own. Right here, and in 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 ink, it's it's much better. Um, I feel like that, but I mean, I'm kind of partial to black and white. Yeah, but I mean, just the the kind of containment line around kind of Irving here that also involves his kind of lo loose hair and giant old yeah. man eyebrows um, is just great. And you can see like the pattern in the ceiling that's almost unnecessary. Uh, all of the different pieces of clothing. Mm -hmm. And then we see a transition. So I love this. So there's been a gunshot. She doesn't use guns because they're loud and they draw attention. But Irving shot this person. So she tries to escape. And we see her uh, climbing out the window, climbing down the staircase. Um, climbing into her own home, dressing as if she's going to bed and then running outside wrapped in a robe, asking the officer what's going on. Start to see a little bit of tension between her and her husband. Uh, ironically, her husband hears a noise and says that he'll go take care of it when she is likely much more capable. Um, and, uh, and I just love... I love what uh, Joan starts doing with this dress. So she is wearing uh, kind of a full length sheer nightgown and uh, they continue to find situations where they put her um, into silhouette with yeah. that nightgown. And so what's happened is um, they're being attacked. They're being attacked by Irving. So the business relationship has gone poorly. The dog is dead. Um, Husband takes the girls to go do something. Wow. And uh, then we shift into the 1930s. Unbelievable. So this is a flashback. This is a flashback. And I'm just going to go really slowly across these panels because the amount of detail in the shack is just incredible. Also, just her control over thick and thin. Like, I mean, I'm sure we're going to get in style, but it's just like so astounding. Like... The, the choices to kind of, and the expressions like she manages to pull off. I just can't believe that that ink work. Yeah. I mean, she's, yeah, she's just a master at this, but so good. And I love this woman is, so this is Josie as a child. Yeah. And uh, if, if we're shifting into kind of meaning or message, I feel like these, these few pages really encapsulate it. So Josie says, but why? And her mom says, not now, Josephine, but why, Mama? You want to know why? Because I was born with nothing, which means you were born with nothing, and because you had the bad luck of being born a girl. So you're doubly nothing, and so am I, whimper. She says, come on, it's not all that, it's all that bad. She says, it's not. And as we're doing this, we're slowly pulling the camera back. And so you'll, you'll kind of see, and look at the, even the textile patterns are period appropriate. I also like that at this point we've almost lost um, like panel borders are starting to kind of flow into each other. Like, so it's yeah. a less structured um, page where it's, I think maybe like suggesting like more vivid brokenness or something. That's really cool. Right. And so her mom is explaining how it's not bad to be underestimated. And she says, it's not, she says, not at all. As long as everybody thinks we are nothing. That means that they'll never know that deep down we are something. What's that? Survivors. And then we pull out to see. Look at that nightgown. Guy. I'm sorry. Just like the, right. the the costuming in this, like the frills on that nightgown in the bottom left, uh, just the elegant lines and like that, that pose on the right page, on the top left of that page. It's just, I, I am amazed by the costumes and the detail on like the, the, yeah, like, and, and look at, the little frills on like those towels. I mean, it's unbelievable. Right. <laughs> and look at the storytelling of this character design. 
Yes. He is like skinny due to starvation and yet has really strong arms. I mean, yeah. this, this is a working family. Yeah. And she has like, yeah, like poor posture, but like poor posture that would come from like, you know, working. Well, yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, this is poor posture from manual labor. Yeah. That's um, unbelievable. And then uh, and then just the juxtaposition of the life that she's built for herself as an adult based on where she came from, which literally has, you know, her mom telling her, uh, you know, keep smiling because that's the only thing that really anybody wants to see from you anyway. Um, with arsenic on the table, having just killed her husband. Wow. Into this beautiful, just, just a minute. Just let's just look at the lace that's been inked here. That's unbelievable. Like, I just can't believe the, yeah. <laughs> so we've got this, we've got lace, we've got blowing curtains, we've got broken glass, shadows, floorboards in the shadows. And, uh, and if, if you haven't been grossed out yet, you might want to turn away at this point in time because it gets really violent. Oh, before, um, we, before we transition, Gary was saying, I thought the 30s pan panels were the best of the entire thing. So yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, I would love to see just a world of Dust Bowl era Joel Jones. Yeah. It, I mean, it's just it just blew me away. I mean, they're, they're some of the most incredible pages I've, I've seen. Um. And I love, I love the garish nature of like, we're still in Florida. We still have this hokey, awful looking neon Santa Claus, uh, even though, even though we've got Irving coming down the street here, what, what we found out is that he is, he is the Nazi doctor that was killing everybody. Um, and so they have this big shootout and uh, the girls are gone. The husband's gone. And it's, uh, it's Josie and mother Schuler. Uh, against Irving and this next shot here is just so inventive just this that is. this cutaway of their home and you can see where they might go and what might happen we can see mother Schuler here like pushing against the door you see Irving coming in you see Josie shouting instructions and uh, we see which lights are on and which lights are off Okay, so a shot like that, and it's impossible for me not to bring up Chris Ware. That's like, right. you, you, I mean, uh, anyone familiar with Chris Ware's work, especially like building stories where he does these cutaways of that. So she's probably looking to him for this kind of, like this kind of panel idea. Oh, but I would imagine, really. I would imagine so. And I also think the World Fair is a good indication that she was influenced by Chris Ware as well. Wow, unbelievable. That's really cool, though. That's so hard to pull off. And look at the different lighting in that spread, too. It's just oh, so cool, like the different yeah. color. Yeah, and the interesting and the interesting thing about this shootout. Um, so, spoiler warning: if you guys if you guys don't want this book ruined, uh, just you know, mute it for the next uh, sixty seconds or something. But uh, he shoots her finger off. She stabs him in the foot. He later gets a gun pulled on him and uses the knife that was in his foot to stab her. And so like there is like continuity of where objects are. There's an object's permanence that you don't see a lot in comics. Like things are introduced that are used later. I love it. And then, uh, so she gets stabbed. It's fairly gruesome. Uh, Josie hits him in the head with uh, cooking Sherry and then lights him on fire. Kind of like karate kicks him out of the house. Um, you know, she's basically saying, you just got stabbed twice. It's not that big of a deal here. Hide in this closet. They still don't like each other. He, he gets in his car now looking like Freddy Krueger drives the car through the house. You know, he's whacking her with this, uh, crowbar. And then I'm going to skip this page because this is just really gross. Um, she bashes his head in with a brick. He doesn't die. And, uh, so that's basically, uh, that's basically it. And at the end, we see that uh, her handler, Peck, who she killed uh, in volume one, comes back with a scar on his face to say, hey, I've got a job for you. Huh. A cliffhanger. Awesome. 
Um, okay, so before we get into meaning or anything like that, I, I feel like it might be time to balance the books. So I'm going to kind of hop in here. Um, uh, it's time to balance the books. The Indie Review Show is brought to you by Audible, and you can get a free audiobook and support the show by going to audibletrial.com backslash IRS. Um, you, you won't believe it, but like we managed to get IRS for almost anything. So, uh, remember it's almost tax time and, uh, that should help you remember the indie review show, the IRS. So when you go to audible trial.com IRS this week, I'm recommending, um, this book, which is talking to strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. It's a bit of a change of play pace from all the murder and mayhem um, of what we've been reviewing, but it's a book where it talks about uh, sort of different, very famous scenarios where people have been deceived by people that they thought um, were truthful um, up to like CIA officers who literally are trained to detect lies and yet, how are they fooled? Um, how was Neville Chamberlain fooled by Adolf Hitler? Um, why are assaults on the rise? Do television sitcoms teach us something about the way we relate to each other that isn't true? And uh, Malcolm Gladwell, in his, I mean, anybody who's read his work, I also recommend The Tipping Point, um, is just a master at taking interwoven stories and kind of weaving them into a narrative that uh, comes back with like a really impactful uh, takeaway that you can apply to your life. And so I, I definitely recommend this for anyone interested in leadership, in management. Like this has definitely been a helpful book uh, for me when it comes to art direction. And uh, honestly, for freelancers or people dealing with clients or just kind of struggling to know how to kind of navigate a world where people aren't always telling the truth. So, so that's my recommendation. Um, also, if you like this book or any of the books we're recommending, make sure you go to irsagency.com. Uh, a really easy way to sh support the show is to click on one of the links on irsagency.com before you purchase anything on Amazon. Uh, that gives us a kickback, and it doesn't raise the price for you. So if you want to um, continue to see these reviews, it's a good way to just kind of help us out. So that was our audit uh, or our balancing of the books. And now let's get back to the audit. Um, uh, and voila. So, yeah. Um, and we actually have a mailbag. So one of our, uh, one of our watchers, listeners, viewers, people, friends, agents has, uh, has, uh, done a review. So we're going to watch that now. Hey everybody. I'm Gary Hodges. I'm the writer and artist behind the indie comic series, Dinosaurs vs. Mars Bots. And I'm here to give my about 90 second take. I'm going to start that over so you can see his branding because ours was covering. Yes. Hey, everybody. I'm Gary Hodges. I'm the writer and artist behind the indie comic series Dinosaurs vs. Mars Bots. And I'm here to give my about 90-second take on Joel Jones's Lady Killer. Start the clock. The back cover shorthands Lady Killer is Mad Men meets Dexter. But to me, it's classic pulp. I can easily picture it with art by someone like Robert McGinnis though it would be a lesser book for it, as Lady Killer's greatest achievement is Jones's artwork. It's a strange thing to say given the grotesque content, but Jones's expertly done inks are just fun. Her strokes have flourish and feel loose, yet maintain precision. There are exacting details, but always with one foot firmly in pure cartooning. So while the folds and structure of a vintage dress might be technically perfect, the pattern isn't obligated to conform to its contours. Whether it's skull-shaped plumes of steam rising off poison drinks, or playfully exaggerated perspectives, Jones's inks ooze confidence and style. I especially admire the fact she never passes up an opportunity to put her characters in some specific, complex, and beautifully designed space. Settings that'd be a nightmare to draw, but are worth it. They're beautifully composed, meticulously detailed, and great fun to look at. Jones's interiors are better than most covers. So does the story match the visuals? I did enjoy Lady Killer's wry sense of humor. For example, a Tupperware party that devolves into double murder, the victims parted out into said merchandise. But personally, I would have liked a little more meat on this bone. I never once caught Lady Killer being subtle or thoughtful or even especially interesting. From the stained glass image of Satan tempting Jesus that looms over an ominous job offer to the story's ultimate villain being not just a serial killer, but a Nazi as well, Lady Killer is broad 
and the little bit it does have to say about things like American society and gender feels thin and well-trodden. In its defense, I don't think Lady Killer was aiming for smart. It was aiming for entertaining. And there it succeeds. I devoured the entire 256-page book in one sitting. I had to see what happened next, literally. I always wanted to see Jones's next drawing. This was my first exposure to Jones's work, and I wasn't just inspired by it. It made me want to raise my game. So it's definitely a keeper. I love it. I think one of my favorite things about that is that Gary is flanked by a sign that says presentation in progress and a human skull. <laughs> <laughs> this is so true. Um, yeah. Gary's work is really incredible on its own. And uh, Gary, thank you for submitting it, uh, submitting that. That's very cool. And uh, if you guys are interested um, when watching this, like you can go to irsagency.com and you can actually see uh, what books we have coming up. So if you want to make like a little video or a short review or an audio review, um, there's, uh, you know, directions on how you can kind of do that on irsagency.com, which is kind of our, our hub. And I'm still mystified that we were able to get that URL. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I felt like that was a really insightful review and I look forward yeah. to, to hearing more, uh, more thoughts from people in the future. So um so josh uh i'll i'll kind of i'll kind of follow up but uh wh what did you think and uh any anything that you saw that you might uh that you might influence your work in the future so i really dig like action um for just sheer entertainment and and interest and i would say like it definitely seems like action and horror and and kind of pulpy goodness so it, it seems like a fun read I don't think like my life is going to change from reading the book. I don't feel like it's going to impact me in any profound way on a story note. So I just want to want to say that like I'm not really super blown away by the story, although I have to admit like the premise is pretty interesting where it's just having a housewife um, hit hit woman in that era. That premise in itself seems like it's going to solve the story. So on a story note, I don't take a ton away, but I am curious to read it just for entertainment. Um, on a on an art level, I'm uh, I'm stunned by um, the the level of detail that Joel Jones is willing to go into on a page by page basis, and yet also the level of control she has. Even though she's capable of doing like immaculate detail, she also knows where to hold back on detail and kind of keep it very simplified. Um, so to me, I think that that is a, a definite unique takeaway from it. Just the use of line weight, um, simplification, um, the playing with form. Like she, she's a master at like kind of taking a figure and sort of breaking down um, their silhouette in a unique way where it's almost like almost making it like geometric um, in, the, in the way that like a nose, she'll take a nose and kind of create like a more stylistic line, but it's still representational. Um, and I, I'm, uh, I'm overall just very stunned by her work for my own work. I definitely think like her variety in framing is really interesting for me. Like her choice of camera angles. Um, there were a couple in particular, I know it's weird after all that stunning artwork. Um, I mean that cutaway scene, of course I want to do that at some point in a comic. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I've, I've always been looking for a good opportunity to do it and it looks like a nightmare to kind of work out, but that's just stunning whenever it's pulled off. Um, so that's definitely a takeaway. The other would be like little subtle things that may not be noticeable, like to, to most people. I mean, definitely like um, I'm seeing through that, like the impact that you can have through uh, paying attention to costuming, which mm -hmm. I think is really cool where it's like, it goes such a long way where she kind of goes the extra mile to make sure that the costumes are period specific and even the hemlines and the, the use of pattern in areas where a lot of artists, including myself might've just chosen the like, Oh, those are drapes and they don't have a pattern on them. Like they're just drapes. And then it's like, no, she's going to put every, every chance there's a possibility to have pattern that pulls you back in the period and uh, reinforces the theme, she's going to do it. So that that's really inspiring. But for me, the biggest takeaway is mainly like those mid shots 
that you saw when she was in the office with the boss um, where it's like this low angle shot that's kind of like right in the middle of the room and it just gives so much power and presence and it definitely reflects like a, a, that's the part that kind of makes me think of like Mad Men because the whole series Mad Men is shot like that very wide, very mm -hmm. low. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's a really powerful angle that I actually don't employ enough in my work. And, and I definitely think, uh, seeing it used so effectively, I mean, there's a lot you can take away from this, like different ink usage. I mean, like you pointed out Corey and uh, toward those last panels where you literally have like 20 different textures on one page and they're right. not done in like a tacky, like high schooler playing with ink kind of way where it's like, now I'm going to do some rough texture. It's like, it's, it's a master yeah. uh, inker, like approaching these things in, in different ways. So I think stylistically, um, it's definitely a book I'm going to have to pick up on a content note. It's, it just seems like a lot of fun, but I definitely, yeah. um, I wouldn't even say like the content feels like it's pushing like to like a level of like Pulp Fiction, which sort of played with Pulp in a way that was kind of new and different and sort of cut it up. Um, and, and went against expectations. Um, there's definitely a lot of things like that, like Tarantino did with playing in that same kind of sandbox that I feel kind of went against expectations a little more than this. Um, but yeah, the, the art just, um, the art is on its own, like uh, Joelle Jones, like I'll be looking into uh, following her work and checking out what she's doing. I know she's working on like major comics now. Um, and I'm gonna have to kind of check out um, I, I'm probably going to have to pick it up just for that. Also, it's just a joy to look at, like whether I'm going to pull from it for my work or not. It's just, a, it's definitely an artist I, I can admire, especially their use of, like I said, the clothes, just, just the way that every fold is hanging correctly to the anatomy of the character is it, it's a really hard thing to pull off. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really impressed with that to pull that off sequentially is, I mean, mind boggling. Well, so and you, and you can see this is a page. This is a page of hers that I have in the background. As is this. Um, one of the things that impresses me is she is not drawing twenty by thirty. She's drawing eleven by seventeen. Yeah. Um, and so the amount to me, the thing that I take away is the incredible control that she has, kind of on a micro level. Um, yeah. You know, the, the slightest little movement of that brush that she's using, uh, you know, can create. Uh, you know, the width that she wants or the, or the line variation, uh, you know, the, the, the angle or whatnot, um, including just the speed at which she's doing it. And yet it's still, it's still so precise. Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest thing that I think, the biggest thing that I will continue to study of hers that I, that, that I don't know if I could say that I'll steal it because I don't know if I have the ability to do that now, maybe years from now, um, the acting that she puts in the character spaces. And, yeah. And, their gesture and their bodies is is amazing. It's it's incredible to me to see um, how well she can communicate um, that that duplicity and the juxtaposition, the contrast of mood between what the character is saying and what the character is feeling. Um, you know, without having an inner monologue or narrator say, you know, Josie is upset. You know, yeah. like you can see what's going on, even though the words are contradicting that because most of the comic she is uh she is showing this conflict um you know that, that she feels this character is in yeah. um, because of her situation and and the the fact that you can see that conflict and from panel to panel you can see the decisions that her characters are making like now i'm deciding to be excited as i say it's time for dinner you know that 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 type of thing i think is is phenomenal I love it. Um, I did want to pull up like Frank in the chat said, uh, no me gusto Josh Okori pero si me gusta este libro translation. I don't like Josh Okori, but I do like this book. And he was Fair saying, enough. if you ever review a Spanish book, I'll do a, a, video, a review video for IRS in Spanish. That's hilarious. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I think that's really cool. And I mean, it's just remarkable. Um, the level of her art is is sophisticated on so many different levels um, that it's it's hard to almost pinpoint one because even just like her backgrounds and stuff it's like I can't it's hard to even start on it because she doesn't have a lot of weaknesses 
as an artist. Yeah. So that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So that's uh, that's Lady Killer by Joel Jones. Um, the first volume was uh, co-written by uh, Jamie Rich, and the second volume was written by uh, the artist and illustrator. So um, anyway, I think it's a phenomenal book. I at some point in time, if anyone ever listens to me, I believe it's Dark Horse. Yeah. Dark Horse, if you're listening to me, give me an oversized artist edition with no color of this book. That's I want an 11 by 17 of just the inks. Uh, yeah. I think I think it would sell like hotcakes. Man. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the color and I think the color work is great. But just being an ink nerd and seeing how much control she has over that brush. It's like, I really want to see that just without any color distraction, although it is beautifully colored. Um, yeah. 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 So um, anyway, so that's that's the book. And uh, coming up, let me scroll over here um, and we will share. If you go to irsagency.com, not a screen. Sorry, I should have done this beforehand. There we go. Um, go to irsagency.com. You will see, here's this. Uh, here's an email where you can uh, you can do like Gary did and give us your review of the book um, up front. We'll always have next week's um, thing here. If you want to purchase the book, you can buy it here. And uh, next week, next Monday at this time, Josh is going to go through Little Nemo and the Palace of Ice and Further Adventures by Windsor McKay. Yes. I will do uh, funny pulp stuff and Josh will do like the foundations of this medium. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so if you want to check that out or any of the other things that we'll be doing, um, this is the list of where that goes. All of our past episodes are going to be down here at the bottom with links uh, as appropriate to those things. And really make sure that you go in and um, subscribe to... Um, IRS agency on YouTube, because this will be the last time that this is on my channel. And next week will be the last time that it's on Josh's channel. We will hundred percent be um, on IRS agency's YouTube channel in the future. So I love it. All right. Let, let me just check the, yeah. All right. Gary so, says yes, please. And yeah. it's that. Thank you to all the IRS agents who joined us in the chats and, uh, and uh, we will be doing future audits. And so thank you guys. Like we really appreciate that. Thank you for your audit contribution, fellow IRS agent, Gary Hodges. I feel like we are going to have to come up with some special designation for people who actually submit a review that we can play or yes. on here. Like they should be a member of the agency. And they should be, a, they should be a special agent. That's it. So Gary, so, has, Gary has been publicly promoted to special agent of the Indie Review Show. I love it. So special agent Hodges. Um, I love it. <laughs> there we go. All right. So we will see you guys next time. And make sure to read indie comics and do cool things and uh, share this stuff with other people. And uh, be awesome. We'll see you in a week.